We're here with Michael Adams, and what is this spot we're looking at, Michael? This is what uh, I guess originally was called the Tunnel View, but it's also a new Inspiration Point. The old Inspiration Point was on the uh, wagon road that came in up above uh, the tunnel here. But this is a famous, very famous site that my dad really enjoyed coming back to on many occasions over all the seasons. And it's a spectacular site today. And he got the famous shot, the Clearing Storm. Clearing Winter Storm was one of his most well-known, popular. So how did he get that shot? Did he just wait well, or I, know that he... It was a, obviously a snowstorm day and he came up here and I don't know how long he waited, but I understand it was 1938. We'd always thought it was done in 44, but apparently it was 1938. Wow. And I imagine he just set up the camera and, and waited for the moment when Either the waterfall did something or a cloud's moved away from, the, from El Cap or, or uh, Half Dome, and uh, he took that image. And there it was. And there it was. And then the visualization part is just in terms of knowing, he must have known that if he came here during the storm, that obviously that was going to be a, a really good photograph. I, I'm sure. And I mean, he loved the sight, and he loved the scenery, and uh, he wanted to do something with it. And, uh, you know, and waiting for the ideal moment. I, again, have no idea how long he waited, but a lot of times uh, he knew the best time of day for a particular uh, photograph. Right. So he wouldn't waste his time coming up here in the morning. So he must have known, you know, approximately what would be the best from the lighting standpoint. So he would come then. Right. What would you say your favorite story in terms of you being with him when he was photographing? What sort of stands out? As well, I think I told you before about the moonrise picture being with him yeah. uh, in New Mexico when I was seven years old. Uh, and then other pictures I was with him that have turned out to be very famous, well-known, uh, the uh, Mount McKinley uh, oh, yeah. Wonder Lake in Alaska in 1947. Uh, I was there with him and that, and that has an interesting story we mentioned earlier, but uh, he, we went out at 1.30 in the morning because the sun was up all night practically, right. and we were on this ridge with the wind blowing, and he couldn't keep the camera still, so we dropped off the ridge to get out of the wind, and when we did, the mosquitoes were <laughs> pretty horrendous, and he actually, on a couple of pictures, had a mosquito between the slide and the film, and uh, when he printed those, it came out looking like an airplane in the in the picture. Those were, those were really interesting pictures that I was with him Yeah, uh, when he took them. The thing that stands out for me too is that he was able to pass on his knowledge unlike many other photographers who really never wrote down what they did. So obviously he put a lot of time and attention into teaching and writing. And He did. He started the, uh, the traditional workshop as we know it today in 1940 here in Yosemite. Uh, with Edward Weston as one of the instructors, and they photographed around the valley. They had a group of students. They went up into the high country, Tenaya Lake especially. And uh, that format of, uh, at that time, would be a week long. Of They'd come and stay here in the lodging in the Yosemite, and they would daily make trips. Some of it was darkroom work. A lot of it was just talking about photography, and then the students showing their photographs, and then Ansel showing some of his. Yeah. Uh, it was very congenial, and uh, I think people loved it. Well, he must have cared a lot about what other photographers knew and how they were working because he spent so much of his life training and teaching and he doing did. workshops. And he knew most of the photographers that were, you know, of his era, uh, and many of them joined him in workshops here in Yosemite. And in later years, he, uh, when he was really not getting around as well, he had, uh, for several years, the same format workshop in the Carmel area right. and stayed on the coast, closer to home. We'd have everybody into his, his home there and uh, Amazing. enjoyed it. Like, when was the zone system developed? The zone system was developed uh, essentially during World War II. He and another fellow at the... Uh, Fred Archer? Fred Archer yeah. at the school in the... What was the school in Los Angeles? The, yeah, the right. The, okay. Whatever that school yeah. was, Ansel helped there, taught there off on. And he and Fred Archer kind of put that thing together. And, and then Ansel made it well known by publishing on it.
Can you give a little brief summary for a fairly new photographer what the zone no, system means? You asked the wrong person. Okay. I don't. I would <laughs> I'll do hate that later. to do it. I, you know, I would hate to do it because I'd probably do it incorrectly. Well, essentially, it's just a way of looking it's, at the scene. And, and he, he just divided the illumination into 10 zones. Exactly. Zone 5 being sort of the middle gray zone. Zone 10 would be fully white and zone 1, I guess, was black. Right. But, but with that, he could come up with an exposure and it helped control not only the exposure of taking the picture, but it also helped when he went to the darkroom. So it was a complete process. So there's the photo cycle. Yes. Well, thank you, Michael. You're most welcome. Okay. I'm glad Great. you're here. Nice talking okay. to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs>